This is a Thorium Energy Alliance Technology Talk from the inaugural Future of Energy Conference, October 2009. To find out more about Thorium Energy, please visit thoriumenergyalliance.com. This talk is from Paul Houle. It is about computer modeling and simulations of reactors. Back in 1980, they figured they'd have a test reactor running in 85, they'd be switched to a standardized, they'd have a standardized design worked out, and really running commercially by 2010. So they're talk, you're talking 30, 40 years, potentially, is the end of the rainbow that we're talking about. Uh, fast result might be possible, but the thing is, we don't have a reactor now. So we're talking in the next two or three years, what are we going to do to get to the point where we've got a reactor, we've got a specific proposal, we can really talk about getting funding. And to do that, we have to think ahead even further, because way, way out, 20, 30 years from now, what are the benefits of liquid fluoride reactors going to be? Uh, We've heard a little bit about it, and it's great. You're talking large amounts of energy, large environmental benefits, but we have to quantify it, particularly when it comes to all these tough issues, such as proliferation, and just the nuts and bolts of what kind of materials are going to be needed, and what, uh, what it's going to cost. Here's a really old diagram I like that talks about the uh, inputs that go into reactor design. It's from 73, but the fundamentals haven't really changed. Most of what we're talking, we're talking about today is about the nuclear design. It's about the neutronics, and also the way neutrons cause chemical changes. The, you, you, your fuel is consumed, fission products are produced, aconites are breeded, and uh, that's really critical for modeling the fuel cycle. Another major element is thermal hydraulics, which is, it controls how, it controls how much heat you get out of the reactor. The physical configuration, the size, the contents of the reactor are determined by neutronic calculations because you have to have a critical mass, but uh, how much power you can get out of it really depends on your ability to get power out. It's really complicated for solid fuel reactors because heat's kind of moving out of the fuel element into the fuel. If anything happens to if you can't get the heat out fast enough, you have fuel damage. And in a liquid reactor, you're pumping fuel out. So the static thermal hydraulics is simpler, but there's lots of questions when it comes to a real dynamic system. And finally, there's materials, which, in a, which includes the fuel and includes the liquid fuel. So we'd put fuel processing under that materials category. But you know, you've also got the, material, the issues with graphite and issues with uh, alloys that hold uh, the fuel. So the outline of what I'm talking about and some of the research I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about is we're gonna start with neutronic analysis. Uh, then we're gonna move on towards depletion, which is the old school way. I mean, in a, in a, in a breeder, you, nothing really gets depleted. You're, you're creating fuel, but in a, an LWR, you're depleting your fuel. Eventually you run out. And then finally, fuel cycle analysis. So in, in depletion, we're looking at just what's going on inside one reactor. In fuel cycle analysis, we'd be looking at from the mine to waste repository and everything in between. Uh, so, there's two methods of neutronic calculation. Uh, if you look at the really early work on fluoride reactors back in the 50s, everybody used the, the, fusion, the fusion equations. Uh, they're a lot faster than the Monte Carlo methods, but uh, have a problem that you, there's a lot of physical approximations there that are really specific to the type of the reactor. And really in the 90s, we've seen Monte Carlo methods really emerging as the, the method of choice for doing reactor design calculations, particularly for anything that's not a light water reactor. Uh, and uh, the really good news is that there's a great code available called MCMP5 that people have used to do work in uh, molten salt reactors, and they're also using it for pretty much everything else. It's developed at Los Alamos National Lab, and it's distributed by the Radiation Safety Information Computational Center at Oak Ridge. Uh, the first thing you do with it is figure out what configuration is going to be critical. So you're, you're going to start out with a configuration, kind of add a little more uranium-233 to the mix until it turns on. Then you can... Uh, Look, look at the neutron flux in the reactor. Calculate the neutron spectrum. Uh, and with the Monte Carlo method, you're really modeling one neutron hits one atom, you roll the dice, you see what it splits into. So it gives you an idea of what nuclear transformations are going on. So it's telling you the rate at which protoactinium is being created. It's telling you the rate at which protoactinium decay can tell you the rate protoactinium decays. It can tell you, it can, it can be the beginning. It gets your input for depletion, depletion calculations. And, uh, What's really great about it is it can be used for shielding, it can be used for arbitrary calculations. So it's not only good for reactor physics, but it can be used to make sure criticality never happens anywhere in the fuel processing system. It can analyze pretty much anything. Uh, a really great paper came out this year from uh, some people in the Czech Republic at the Institute in Res. And these guys looked at a two-fluid reactor that's really advanced, really aggressive. It's almost like something that fell off a UFO. Uh, they started out with a design where they, uh, they, they kind of started out with a design where they had tubular fuel elements the fuel solids is the purple stuff that's in the uh, that's in the center of the end, that's in the center of it, and then there's an annular ring that has the, the thorium salt in it. Uh, they played with the parameters of that, and they were like, well, 
They wanted to make the fuel channel bigger, and they couldn't really do it in that design, so they eliminated the helium spaces and made the fuel elements these blocks. Uh, the yellow stuff, the moderator. Uh, something that's a little deceptive about this picture is that you see a lot of purple and not a lot of blue, but the fuel salt is a low concentration. You know, it's about 0.26% U233. The fertile salt is 27% thorium. It's about twice the actual physical density of uh, the fuel salt. So even though the thorium doesn't look like there's a lot there, there's really a lot in the central core. Uh, these guys have a critical mass for one gigawatt of electric reactor in the 160 to 208 kilogram range, depending on different designs they looked at. A breeding factor in the 1.07 to 1.12 range, and that's an astonishing doubling time of like three to four years. Uh, this is, I think, the fastest doubling time I've really seen for any kind of reactor. And uh, there's one little bit of magic to all this, and to, to make it work so well, they're pushing the fuel through the reactor at a very high rate, about eight meters per second. And uh, you know that's and and getting and, and getting getting a really high power, getting a really high neutron flux in your in your in your in your fertile in your in your fissile material is really key to utilizing, getting the most out of it. Their design also has a, a radio blanket, so uh, there are a few elements on the outside that have nothing but thorium in them. And at the top, these annular the annular uh, the annular channels open up into a plant, which creates a uh, an axial blanket as well. Something kind of interesting about this is that we haven't really seen uh, the external blankets have really been disappearing from designs for fast reactors because of concerns about proliferation. Because now you, know, the, you can always increase your breeding ratio by adding more, more uh, U238 out the edge, but it doesn't get exposed very well. Those issues are kind of different in a, in a, in a liquid reactor because things are homogenous. They're getting mixed up. There's no area in this reactor that's not getting a good flux of uh, neutrons.